Signore e signori, buonasera. Benvenuti e bentornati alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University for this adventure in Italian opera with Fred Plotkin. Normally I tell you a couple of things about Fred, always trying to find something new to say, and there is quite a lot of new things being Fred. Um, tonight I just want to remind you that his new book, of which his co-author is upcoming, and the title is Eating in Italy. Publication date, January 1st, but you can pre-order it. It would be a great Christmas present, I think, so go ahead and do it. Uh, as you know, Fred is conducting actually now a course on Verdi, on Idagio. The course has already started, but you can register anyway and uh, listen to the previous classes. Normally, I don't say anything about Fred's guest because it's his privilege to present them. And I'm not going to introduce uh, Speranza Scapucci tonight. Um, and just a little episode. Normally, after our uh, adventures, our conversations, we go for dinner to the Tirosegno Club here in the village, and we have dinner with the, the singers, the conductor, whoever it is there. So we are having dinner one evening, and there is Fred, there is Gian Andrea Noseda, uh, a few other people, I believe also a couple of singers, but I don't remember exactly. And there is Lydia Bastianic with us, who is a good friend of Fred, and she loves opera, and she's also a good friend of Gian Andrea. So we are having dinner, and the maitre d' comes and asks Lydia, there, is, there are two Canadian little girls there that recognize you and would like to ask for your autograph. Do they bother you if they come here? Oh, no, absolutely. And, and Lydia, as gracious as she is, welcomes the girls, writes something uh, uh, on a piece of paper, and then she uh, tells them, thank you for watching my show. But at this table, the most impor important person is not me. It is that gentleman there. And she pointed to Gian Andrea Noseda. And she explained very plainly, but very effectively, the power of the conductor. He raises a hand and everybody stops. And he raises a finger and all the violins start playing. And, so, and she told them, you want to do something like that. Are you studying an instrument? Are you studying a musical instrument? Well, start. And to me, that idea that, that Lydia, that she's a celebrity, TV personality, pointed the girls in the direction of a conductor was particularly poignant. And somehow, Speranza like, made that hope truth before that gir those girls will be adults. But it's very important for girls and young people in Italy and in this country to have people like Speranza with her determination, with her incredible talent, and with her being able to fit into the Italian tradition and at the same time finding her own way. And that's what she has done. And without further ado, I would like to ask you to please welcome Fred Plotkin and Speranza Scapucci. So, thanks to all of you. Just a couple of corrections to Stefano's kind presentation. My book title, I'm co-author with Rick Steves, and the title is Rick Steves Eating in Italy. All of his books are Rick Steves and then something. But when, during the pandemic, we were all stuck where we were, Rick decided that he wanted to write a book about Italy, and he knows certainly a lot about Italian travel. His Rick Steves' Italy book is his best-selling of his 49 books until the one that you're all going to buy, which is co-author with Fred Plotkin. And we both took our different approaches to Italy. So Rick approached it as a traveler. I approached it as an Italian food lover. And it's a very nice combination because in the book, sometimes it says I and it's both of us. Sometimes it says Rick thinks this and Fred thinks that. So you tend to find your taste and your preference reading the book. And I'm very happy with it. It's my first book in a while. So I do hope that you all get it, even if you're not going to Italy right away. And Speranza Scapucci, even before Italy had a woman prime minister, you were conducting the first Italian woman <laughs> everywhere doing these things. She has had an outstanding career. I saw her early on when she was still a student at Juilliard. And we're going to talk tonight about conducting, about Italy, about music. So please welcome Speranza Scapucci. Good 
Buonasera. Hello. Buonasera. Let me just see. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So I realize, Speranza, that with all the conversations I've done with Italian performers, musicians, I've never interviewed someone who was born and raised in Rome. Yay. And <laughs> that's not by my choice. It just hasn't happened. Cecilia Bartoli has not said yes yet. So, um, you know, we were in the same chorus. You were in the same Santa chorus. Santa Cecilia, well, yes. Then please ask her for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, she might remember me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess it leads to the question talk about musical life in Rome. If you grew up in the capital of the nation where opera was born, a lot of people don't necessarily associate opera with Rome, even though there is the Rome opera, there is the Caracalla, mm -hmm. there's the Accademia di Santa Cecilia. Obviously, there was the Vatican that encouraged music for thousands of years. Obviously, Rome has a musical tradition. Why is it, do you think, that it's not the first city we think of when we think of music in Italy? Uh, I think that, uh, obviously, La, La Scala, because of its history, um, with so many operas premiering there, um, and Verdi writing operas for La Scala, uh, of course, has become the symbol in, somehow of, of Italian opera in the world. This doesn't mean that Rome um, uh, doesn't have a, a great theater where I actually saw my first opera, Teatro dell'Opera di Roma, um, with a really, really great orchestra, actually, um, thanks to the maestros who have been there in the past, um, and more more recently, uh, if you think that uh, Daniele Gatti just finished there, Riccardo Muti was there right before. So, um, and Santa Cecilia has a great, great tradition. It's a great symphonic orchestra. Um, the conservatory where I uh, studied was Santa Cecilia. Santa Cecilia has a conservatory for um, young students, let's say, Piano, it's from when you're 10 years old until you're 20, around. It used to be. Oh, okay. Uh, and, um, and then l'Accademia is, is when, when you're done with the diploma, then you go and perfect your instrument or singing. And it's, it's, a, it's a very ancient um, academy where the great tradition, great, great maestros have taught there. In preparation for our conversation tonight, because I've worked in many Italian theaters, I've never worked at the Accademia di Santa Cecilia. I worked at the Terme di Caracalla many, many years ago at the beginning of my career, but I haven't worked too much in Rome musically. But I decided to read up a bit, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story tonight of the Accademia di Santa Cecilia, but Stefano, I think in the future, we want to do a night just about the Academia di Santa Cecilia. It was founded in 1585 by Pope okay. Sixtus V and was dedicated to three figures, to the Virgin, to San Gregorio, and Santa Cecilia. San Gregorio being the male patron saint of music as in Gregorian chant, ecclesiastical song. Um, its very first place where it performed was the Pantheon in Rome, if you can imagine. And they were there from 1585 to 1622. So basically, when opera was founded, the Accademia di Santa Cecilia was in the Pantheon in Rome. It moved a lot. I'm not going to list all the churches and places it was during the years. But in its first century, it was in six different places. So. Um, then it consolidated under uh, the Roman pontificate and became the Pontificia Academia. And it was not until 1830 that it opened to people beyond musicians. In other words, poets, dancers, editors, musical instrument makers, musicologists, later actors. Um, when cinema came along, cinema. So therefore, the Accademia di Santa Cecilia, named for a musical figure, really was kind of like the Juilliard of Rome, in that whatever art form arrived was incorporated into Santa Cecilia. Some of these subsequently broke away. 
such as the Duzak um, Acting Theater Academy and the Cinema Academy, to name a few. What is also very notable, and I'm making this very short in terms of the story, is that in addition to being a place where music is taught, it has a very important chorus and a very important orchestra. And it's not necessarily a case that other music academies, such as name the big ones, Naples, Palermo, Parma, Bologna, Milan, and others, Venice, um, they're not as famous for their orchestras as they are for their training. So yes, they have orchestras, of course, but it's not that you think of the orchestra of the Parma Conservatory or, or the Palermo Conservatory immediately, but definitely we always think of the Accademia di Santa Cecilia. Part of that is the huge amount of recordings that were done by the orchestra going back to the beginning of recording. And part of the reason for that is RAI, the National Broadcasting Network, Radio First and Television, was in Rome. Yes, there were orchestras elsewhere, such as Rai Torino, but it was based in Rome. And so what I wanted to ask Speranza is, what do you think the relationship is? Because I heard you conduct a few years ago in Washington, the national capital of the United States, between the fact that it's the political capital of Italy mm -hmm. and also that it has these musical institutions, how does, and I'm not talking about funding, but how does the presence of government and the presence of people who come to Rome for political purposes affect the opera and affect the Accademia di Santa Cecilia? Um, I'm, not quite, I'm not so, <clears throat> I don't know so much about it, but what I do know is that um, public funding in Italy goes to Fondazioni Liriche and some symphonic Mm -hmm. uh, is, and Santa Cecilia and La Scala are definitely on the top of the list, usually. Uh, and then there are s several others that get there funding. 14. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, w I was going to say 12, but yeah. Yeah, it's 14. So I really don't know what the dynamics of all of that but as is. But your sensation as a Roman, in terms of when you grew up, yeah. were you aware, obviously, that you were in the capital mm. of the nation of Italy? Yes. That you were the center where the Vatican is? Yeah, my, my dad worked at the Vatican Radio, so... Okay. <laughs> what did he do there? He, he was a radio journalist. Mm -hmm. He was the, um, um, how do you say, the director of yep. the 2 o'clock news. Uh -huh. So every day he would have to gather all the information and then overlook the, the, the radio broadcast. So and we, as kids, spent a lot of time in that building... Because after school, you know, it's like, what are we going to do? So we, we would go and spend time waiting for, for Dad to get out of the radio. And what, what did you grow up They have a great classical music, by the way, program on oh, the yes. radio, Vatican. Did you grow up in the neighborhood near the Vatican? No, no, no. Uh, I, I grew up in the northern eastern part of mm -hmm. Rome. Um, now with the subway, you can get directly to Teatro dell'Opera in... 20 minutes okay. from there. Um, I ask because, number one, I imagine that the Vatican weather report is, we have gray smoke, we have white smoke. We have gray... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, you know, growing up in Rome is... Is special. Because you're growing up there, you don't realize that it's what it is until people come and visit and want to go and watch and see all the big monuments and... Yeah. Um, and so I didn't realize until I moved to New York, I was 19 when I moved here, uh, how sp really, I mean, I knew Rome was special, but how incredibly special it was. And for me, I, I went to the conservatory when I was nine, nine years and a half. And then um, my parents loved music, uh, especially my father, but also my mom. And so brought us to, to the opera when I saw my first opera, I was, think, eight or nine. It was La Sonnambula. Uh, yes, yeah, beautiful. Did you get with up June and Anderson. Did you get up and walk around during the performance? No, but I was so <laughs> fascinated by the story, and it was a beautiful traditional uh, production. And, um, and, and uh, at that time, L'Accademia di Santa Cecilia, the orchestra, would perform in a big hall 
uh, if anyone hasn't been, been to Rome, Via della Conciliazione, it's the big street that brings to St. Peter's, which in the old days was all old buildings, mm -hmm. and then it, during, during the Mussolini era it was torn, torn down and there's this huge um, Via della Conciliazione and there's an uh, auditorium there and uh, I saw so many big concerts of classical music my parents would bring us all the time because my father, especially when, when the Academia was playing there, the building was part of where the Vatican radio was so he would get cheaper tickets. <laughs> Because we were four children, so not easy. Now there's the park, it's called the Parco della Musica. Yeah, now it's a completely new bil yeah. building in a completely different part of Rome. And the Academia is now actually called the Academia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia. Yes. But it was not that way, it was just the way in Washington it used to be the Washington Opera. Now it's the Washington National Opera, as opposed mm. to the Metropolitan Opera or the Metropolitan National Opera. You know. I actually owe to that, and I, I'm thinking about it, in that hall, uh, uh, l'auditorium, uh, I went to many concerts, and one concert I went to was played by a very famous pianist. His name was Georgi Shandor. You remember him? Hungarian. I don't know if anyone... He, Hungarian. Uh, he had moved to the States uh, after the war during communism in Hungary, and he was a student of Bela Bartok. In fact, he premiered the third piano concerto of Bartok, imagine. And I went to see this concert, and I went to see him afterwards in his dressing room. And I told him I was a pianist and that I was studying at Santa Cecilia Conservatory. And he said, oh, well, um, tomorrow before my second concert, why don't you come and play something for me? I was like, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> I, was like, uh, I was preparing my diploma in pianoforte, and so I had Beethoven 109, Wanderer Fantasy of Schubert, uh, many things that today I think, how the hell I, did I learn those pieces? They were so hard. Um, and so I went. He said, come here like an hour and a half before the concert. I'll be here warming up and play something for me. So I'm, there's a point, that's why I'm saying this story. So I, um, I went and I played, I think I played Beethoven and a little bit of Schubert. And then he said, okay, well listen, you know, I teach in a school in New York, it's called Juilliard School. You know about it? I said, yes. Um, he said, when do you finish here in Rome? I said, well, in six months I have my diploma. And he said, uh, in March we have auditions and I think you should come and audition for Juilliard. He said, it's very hard. It's like 500 pianists every year apply, and we only have 20, maybe 22 spots. But come to New York. And that changed my life. So because I just, I just thought about York, it, about the auditorium. It, it happened there. New York, che speranza. Eh? Che speranza. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> And so what was it like for you at 19? Rome, of course, is a huge cosmopolitan city. It's not that you were coming from a little provincia. Yeah. Yes. But arriving in New York, I, I was a little younger than that when I arrived in Italy, and I loved Italy, but it mm. was new, and I had to learn things not only about the country but about myself in the process. You probably were uprooted from what was familiar to something very welcoming, but very unfamiliar. Let's start with the fact that academically, mm -hmm. I, I went to the Dams in Bologna, which is, they sometimes yes. say, Italy's Juilliard, and it was a very different structure because I was used to American education. And arriving in Italy, wonderful, and I loved it, obviously, but it was a completely different mm -hmm. experience. What was it like for you going in the other direction and landing in New York at 19 and dealing with the very high-pressure environment of Juilliard? Yeah, it was quite something. I, um, on the one hand, it was shockingly easier for me in some things, coming from my Italian edu education, because at the conservatory, uh, in 10 years, I studied piano, chamber music, I did very, very thorough um, um, harmony, ar armonia, which is um, 
like here they call it ear training, but really it's it's like um, composition to a certain extent. You know, three years, then three years of music history, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of things. Uh, a, a choral, uh, we had to sing in the in the coro and. So when I arrived um, at Juilliard, there were all these entrance exams to place you in the different classes, like ear training, or uh, there was a course called L&M, Literature and Music, which was a combination of, of hist music history. And, and I remember ear training, for example, I, I passed the test, like, it, it was so easy for me because Somehow, I didn't know that in this country, when you arrive at the bachelor uh, level, not everyone has done solfege the way we do it in Italy since we're four. So, um, for me, beating time and s saying do re mi fa sola si do was uh, easy. Mm -hmm. For other students, it was a completely new new language. So, I did, I think, six months, and then the teacher said, "Do you want to be my teaching assistant?" Wow. So. <laughs> so that was easy. On the other hand, other things were hard because uh, the level of playing was monstrous. I mean, I I got to <laughs> Juilliard and I thought, why did they pick me? <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. You know, I, I was thinking, um, there's my 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 fellow p pianists were were incredible technically. You know. Um, I was always for um, Beethoven, Mozart, Schubert, Debussy, uh, and uh, and others ha were doing you know like lists like crazy, and that that was something I didn't. I was not you know it was not my thing. So I always liked making music with other people, and so one of the first things I did when I arrived at the Juilliard was audition for the chamber music class, and I went and auditioned for Samuel Sanders who, to me, was one of the greatest collaborative pianists uh, in history. Yeah. And he took me in his class, and I, I, was, I loved working with Georgi Shandor on my solo repertoire, but I was more excited to do the chamber music, and I formed some quintets and trios and duos. And then I got into the opera world, because many singers were my friends, and they were kept asking me, so how do you pronounce this? How do you say that? How do you do that? And so <laughs> I was like, hmm, hmm, maybe I should go into uh, explore this, you know, and that's. When you were at Juilliard, was Dr. Joseph Polizzi the president? Yes, okay. yes. So this is a wonderful man, and Stefano, we're gonna add this, I want him to come here one night. Amazing he, personality. He's an amazing person, yeah. is an amazing person, who I respect greatly and got to work with a fair amount. And one of the things that Dr. Pulcho did mm -hmm. was create a program called about the artist in society. And very specifically, one of the things I loved at Juilliard, where I've taught somewhat, is understanding that the artist is not just a thing unto herself, apart, working in her studio and mm -hmm. learning whatever she's learning and then going on a stage and doing that, but she's a citizen. and. When you were there, I imagine that was addressed, and did you come to understand yourself differently? Because I don't know if in Italy that's addressed no, so yeah, it was Yeah, it was a completely different experience because when I was in Italy, you know, I was living there, I was growing up, and so I would go to the conservatory as an extra thing because in Italy you don't have, now, it, now it's different, but in my times uh, you, you would have to do the normal school, like high school, and then in the afternoon, go to the conservatory, which was extra thing. Mm -hmm. So some, sometimes, and I'm, I'm not kidding, I would go to school 8 to 2, and then 3 to 8 p.m. Conservatory, then get home, homework, you know. And then the afternoons I was free, I would go at home and practice mm -hmm. piano. So, um, so it was a different routine for me to go to the conservatory. Whereas at Juilliard, for me, it was a, a completely a new chapter for me because I lived in the residence hall. I made some of my best friends today are people I met my first day at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. um, actors, dancers, uh, singers, musicians. Um, so it was like a, a full immersion into the arts, uh, 180 degrees. And I, um, 
socially I was very I'm all, I'm a very social person in general I like being with other people um, so I immediately that's why I went into the chamber music and I also did work study while I was there because I needed to earn some money in fact I think there's some my old manager from the bookstore is here <laughs> hi um, yeah I worked at the Juilliard bookstore and that and there I met even more people so it that's was probably it, where it, I met you then Probably, because who knows? Because my books were sold at that store, probably. and I did signings. I was, I, 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 I put prices. That was prices you. On Thank the, you. On the books, <laughs> yes. And I f used to fold the T-shirts, and then I was upgraded to the cash register too. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> By the way, when Dr. Polizzi left, there were wonderful events in that, and and I did a an event there, and. They gave me a beautiful baseball cap, a Juilliard blue. It said Juilliard Sports, undefeated since 1905. That's because they have no sports. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, the, I, I love mean, that. They don't have I almost, sports on you. I almost never wear that hat because it's too beautiful to want to <laughs> get it perspired in. But but to I, answer your question, I, yeah. I I did have a very. Uh, he's right. It's it's about opening up to the community. Otherwise. I remember the impact was, I felt so tiny compared to everyone else was so, uh, I felt so talented and so, I mean, I didn't know, I, I guess I knew I was talented, but I just, the confrontation, you know, confronto, you know, mm -hmm. uh, comparison, um, that embracing all the other experiences and being part of a community and doing, I used to do gigs with singers and go to um, hospitals and, nursing homes and uh, prisons or whatever, it, that made it all more, um, it, it made more sense to mm -hmm. me. So when you were at Juilliard, you were in what was known as the accompanying program. It's yes. no longer called that because it used to be that the pianist who played for a singer was almost servile and would be the accompanist. Now they're musical collaborators, which is a better term, I they think. They always were, it's just wasn't. They always were. But wasn't the called term like now, that. Yes. And it used to be you would see, for example, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and Gerald Moore, <laughs> when in fact Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and Gerald Moore were the titans of their repertory at that time together. And now you see the names in the same font and the same print, which is as it should be. Um, but while there, you got into, as you began mm -hmm. to say, into opera coaching mm -hmm. because people came to you and asked you for help and so on. That's a very special art. And it is known in Europe often as a repetiteur, in other words, which is, sounds a terrible name, but someone who repeats things all the time. But what it really is, is the person who gives the singer her structure, her guidance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're not in her throat and you're not telling her what to do in the deepest way, but you are leading that person toward interpretation, toward understanding. Um, I've done this somewhat, but I limit myself only to operas I really know. If a singer came to me and said, I'd like you to work with me on Richard Strauss's Daphne, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But if it's Don Carlo or Lohengrin or a few other things, that I can certainly do. But in your case, and obviously you're a professional, you would be called on to do whatever opera was right in front of the singer. Yes. Yes. Talk about that. Um, well, uh, first, I just briefly I have to say that um, because I loved being in New York and at Juilliard, I once I finished my solo degree, then I thought, okay, I'll go into this what is called now collaborative piano to explore more how it is to become um, an accompanist. But it, initially, it was also for instrumental music, but then the passion for opera grew more and more because my father had um, had that passion and still has it and uh, somehow opera was always in the background at home so all of a sudden it was like wow this thing that I used to have at home you know and um, and so to in order to do to to have that tr that training gives you the all the tools you have to learn the languages the diction how you sing in those languages how the vowels change when you're singing according to which voice type you're 
singing in, you know, soprano is different from a tenore or from a baritone or bass. And all of that I uh, perfected at, at Juilliard. And then what I did was I stopped working in the bookstore. <laughs> and to make money, I accompanied uh, voice lessons with practically most of the faculty at Juilliard. And then Renata Scotto, uh, privately, I, I played with her a lot. And, and there I learned about vocal technique. And, um, and so while you're doing that, you're learning also the repertoire, the different operas, different things. Of course, because I'm Italian, my, the beginning of my coaching uh, career was mostly into the Italian repertoire. But uh, I speak fluent French, so I also did that. And, and now since a few years, I've uh, perfected my German. So um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert of that coaching German opera, but um, I've done a lot of leader and, and I've, I know how the language works. So um, I still haven't debuted a Wagner opera. I've done pieces here and there, but mm -hmm. never full opera and I'm dying to do it. Which so. would be your first Wagner opera? Lohen Green. Good, why? Because <laughs> it's quite Italian. It, it is quite Italian, <laughs> yeah. So it would be a good transition. Yeah, I mean, I obviously I love Italy, Italian opera, but I'm also Wagnerite. And Lohengrin, which is coming to the Met this March yeah. for the first time in a long time, and this lady here hears me at BAM, and I'll be lecturing about Lohengrin at BAM, because it's a magnificent work that a lot of people just don't understand. And I'll just tell you very briefly that when I teach Lohengrin, whether to a singer or to an audience, I start with the sentence that I'm saying that this is an opera about belief. Now, belief can be any number of things, but if you accept that it's about belief, which could be in love, in religion, in yourself, in your society, but if you believe something as opposed to not believing something, your default reaction is very different. And when I work with singers, I've taught many Lohengrins. To, I mean, to So when I did make my debut, I should come and me, learn yeah. it with you. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, because <laughs> it's such, it's a magnificent work, but a very mysterious work. And it is very Italian, as you say. It's very lyrical. Uh, there is a lot of mystery in the opera, but there's a lot of, I mean, belief, we get back to that again, that the central character is actually not Lohengrin, but Elsa, which is one of the two longest roles in opera, the other being, you know, Susanna and Lenozzi di Figaro, uh, yeah, are the two longest roles in opera. And so therefore, um, Elsa's really the one that we focus on. And all kinds of horrible things have happened to her, and yet she believes or she wants to believe. And when someone instills doubt in her head, like disinformation that we see in, in media all the time, not in the good media, but we see it all the time, when that alternative facts is what her name used to call it, um, when we start becoming susceptible to that, it's like a virus, and it eats at you. And what is so remarkable in this opera is the way Wagner in his music weaves that through. And it's, a, it's, it's in the score, as you'll mm. see, it's fantastic. But anyway, um, we got off on that diversion, but what I wanted to say to you is I was emailing today with someone I know who was asking me about pronunciation of vowels in Italian, and specifically for singers, because and I told her something she didn't expect to hear, that there are singers, even Italians, who pronounce the vowels wrong. And that might be because the music, in their view or their coach's view, dictates a different pronunciation. But then I know of a teacher in Great Britain, one of the great teachers who taught some of the greatest singers in the past 50 years, who believes that the letter E, as in Empoli, Emilia Romagna, um, should be pronounced not A, like amore, but amore, amore. I can't even mm -hmm. say it. Mm -hmm. Eh. Mm -hmm. Because, and occasionally, amore. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not going to say the name of the singer, but one of the most famous sopranos of the past 50 years 
when she sings in Italian, says Amori and Caff, not Caffi, but she practically would. Mm. And her teacher taught her that. And whenever I've heard other sopranos, because his teacher teaches mostly sopranos, sing that way, I always say, is your teacher so-and-so? Mm. Oh, yeah, how did you know? And you as an Italian, because it is your native language, mm. Where do you come down on pronunciation of vowels, specifically because the note often is carried on the vowel? The way Italian would have it or the way you think it belongs in the music and the character? Both. Okay. Because every singer is different, and according to their voice and where they're singing in the voice and whatever the vowel is, sometimes you have to mix the vowel with another vowel. I'm getting a little technical here, but it's never going to be the same as when you're speaking. Because if you're in a high register, you have to find whatever vowel is comfortable to make the illusion that that's going to be the vowel. But if you need to close it a little bit more, fine. You know? Can you give an example? Um. Ella mi fura Peter. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was just, <laughs> I was just thinking of my, my my name, you know, Speranza, because it comes so many everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, when the tenor in in Bohem sings La Spera, uh, you have to go up. No one's gonna do Spe. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. So, you know, according to La Spera, you're gonna put an A ah or whatever you need to for the squillo to come out. This is an extreme example, but if you're in the middle of the voice and you're doing a recitativo of Mozart, no? I don't know. Cosa stai misurando, caro il mio figaretto? If it, the word is figaretto, you cannot see figaretto because that's not good. But And it's recitativo, you're in the middle of the voice, so then you have to do it right. Do you, sense? yes, it does. Okay. Do you at all work in... For example, let's say you're conducting Cavalleria Rusticana set in Sicily mm. or Pagliacci set in Calabria. Regional pronunciations no. and accents? No. Okay. No, unless it's wanted okay. uh, specifically on a word. Like Turidu and, and his very oh, Sicilian yeah. singing. Well, Turidu, uh, yeah, but the, the text is not in Sicilian. Right. So it, you have to respect the way it's written. Or you wouldn't do, say, Johnny Skiki in a different, mm. more Tuscan way? No. no? Okay. Um, so what I thought we would do, we don't have to move our chairs for this one. It's okay. just a two-minute little video. Um, I found a video from when you were conducting Il Barbieri di Siviglia in Toronto in 2020. Mm. So, Julian, I'm sorry to I didn't alert you ahead of time. It's number one. If you would just play it and you'll... Okay. It'll be above us. Sometimes people think that maybe an orchestra or a chorus or a singer could do it without the conductor, you know. Oh, why can't they just do it with the metronome, you know, taking the time. What surprises a lot of people is that when I say that conducting is so much about driving the music, in other words, uh, through your own thoughts and your sensitivity, sensibility, through your arms, through your eyes, you actually are able to express how you want the music to sound. And that happens through a magical connection of energy that goes from me to the musicians to the stage and then from the stage back to the musicians and out to the audience. So really a lot of it really comes from the podium, but without the musicians and the singers, the conductor is nothing. Barbara Seville is very tricky because, um, first of all, most of the people in the audience know the tunes and so it's very famous. People have expectations of, of how it should sound, how it should be, and therefore putting your personal stamp on it can be challenging. Technically, it's very difficult to play and to sing because it's bel canto and therefore you need to, to have the chops to do it. It's brilliant music, it's very light, but yet very difficult. The orchestra here is really exciting. It's a great group of musicians. They are technically super since the first day we met. Um, 
the energy was very positive and they respond immediately to to anything you ask them i've i've really enjoyed working wor working with this orchestra they're really top 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 class so i love what you said about the energy flowing from you to the orchestra to the singers and so on um i had the pleasure the fantastic pleasure of working a bit with sir george schulte and he began as a reputateur and he came from a time when most conductors did that it's not a given anymore that conductors do that ricardo muti who i've never worked with but i've seen work a lot um loves to teach singers their roles and work with them from the very beginning as would a repetiteur um talk about what you mean about this transmission of energy i think it means in part that you have a strong conception of what the music is saying and that you then t try to convey that but i don't want to put words in your mouth yes um i i think that especially when you're doing opera <sighs> it Opera is comp a complex thing because you have soloists, you have chor chorus, you have the orchestra, you have the staging. So um, in a way, I think that if you sit at the piano with the singers, yourself playing or someone else playing, but working from the beginning, um, then th what you just said can happen, which is work with them on your vision of the piece, but also not imposing necessarily. I mean, give them the idea of your, your vision, but working with them uh, as a collaboration. Because I can have a vision of how Fior di Ligi's aria should be, you know, Per Pietà, for example, which has happened to me. I've conducted this opera quite a bit. I, I, I might have in mind a tempo or a way and then if the soprano comes and her vo voice is lighter than what I had imagined, my vision goes down the toilet, excuse my expression, because I have to deal with a kind of voice that can't do that. So, so my experience as a coach and, and um, someone who has worked behind the scenes is, a, some, let's say, a little bit of an advantage because then I, I know how to adapt my vision without compromising it to that singer because ultimately she's going to be singing up there and uh, I need to make sure that she's comfortable, but at the same time uh, um, not go against what I think maybe Mozart wanted mm -hmm. or uh, with Mozart, it's, it's, uh, we, we have, I think, more ways of interpretation. Uh, already with Verdi, it's a little bit different because there are certain things you have to have to do Verdi and he's very specific in the way he writes the music. So, um, and the same thing happens with uh, the chorus and with, especially with the orchestra. Um, and the only way to, let's say, convince the musicians is through knowledge and through the words. See, the, uh, the great thing about opera is that you have words and the words dictate how the music has to go. Usually it's not the way, other way around. Uh, so if you have a specific accent or a dot or a legato or a staccato, usually it's linked to what has, is being said. And that's why it has to be, uh, for me, it comes from the podium in the sense that you're the one who's giving all this information to everyone, but of course, you're creating the energy, but as I said in the interview, uh, and I really believe it, without them doing it with you, you're no, no, nothing. Does the maestro, which also means teacher, and we use maestro, maestra interchangeably, mm -hmm. and, and I don't talk to women conductors and say mm -hmm. talk about being a woman conductor because you're a conductor. And I've interviewed many women who conduct, so I don't do that Thank you. line of questioning. Mm -hmm. um, even when I had Eve Queller here, I didn't mm -hmm. do that. And, but the conductor is a teacher as mm -hmm. well. Yes. And in effect is the person who's the conduit 
my belief always is that if Mozart or Verdi wrote it, they knew what they were doing. Mm. Yes. It's not that we're here to fix Mozart and Verdi. No. But we have to understand what they want, and that takes a lifetime of work and revisitation of something we think we know. Because yes. it, just to go back to Mozart and Così Fan Tutte, to me, it's a magnificent opera, but a fantastically hard opera to stage, to make plausible. Um, I get in trouble when I say that the music is better than Don Giovanni Lenozzi di Figaro because it was later on, and I think that Mozart kept improving in his music. And although the stories, maybe the other two are a little more compelling, I think that Così Fan Tutte is incredibly compelling if we throw away the superficial issue of sexism and come down to the fundamental issue of psychology. Mm -hmm. These are incredibly complex psychological characters, four young people, at least four young people, who are very confused, very impulsive, uh, very different each among the four of them. Then if the spin of the maid is played by a young person, she doesn't have to be. Um, how she fits in the mix. The casting, to me, the casting of Mozart operas is the hardest casting of any composer. Because if you pick, you can have a great voice, but if you pick someone who doesn't have the right temperament or understanding of what's going on, you wreck the whole opera, or at the very least, you change the chemistry a lot. Um, it was the first opera you conducted yes. at Yale in mm. 2012. Yes. Um, did you have any say in who your singers would be, or were the singers picked? And they uh, it was said, a school production, yeah. so it, I came there, and we had two casts, and it was all um, undergraduates and graduate students. So what was it like for them as young people, as contemporary young mm -hmm. people, playing these roles that are fraught with sexual confusion and hormones and mm -hmm. so on in a most magnificent way. But on the other hand, where the values of today may in many ways be better than the values of those mm -hmm. opera, but many ways are more relaxed, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, sexually in mm -hmm. terms of interaction. Whereas the sexual tension in 1790 would be a different set of rules. I think also it's Naples, but the two girls are from Ferrara. This is something that's not explored often, but I do it, that these two Federese girls wind up in Naples with these two Neapolitan boys. That's combustion. Mm -hmm. And that's something I always try to inject when I'm working with singers on Così Pantute. But what was it like conducting people who were actually the age of the characters? It was great. For me, it was, um, it was my first opera that I did uh, uh, where I wasn't just coaching and preparing all these kids but also conducting them and um, we I mean what was great about it was that they some of them was like the first opera they ever sang fully and so for me um, more than all of these aspects that you mentioned that are more let's say uh, the directors um, let's say, task. I worked on all of that that you're saying musically, like how do you do it in the music? And uh, a lot of the work was concentrated on the recitatives and how to pronounce well and phrase every... And I, I also played the cembalo. I played and conducted, so um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a great experience for me and it was actually right there and then that I decided, okay, I'm done with being a, a you know, just a, a not just, but you know what I mean, a repetitor, I need to like be a conductor. Yes. Um, sticking with Così Fan Tutte, because it's an opera I love, um, to me one of the great moments of suspense in all of opera is to s discover how the director and perhaps the conductor have decided how the opera ends because Da Ponte sort of left that a little bit vague mm -hmm. and Mozart's music can suggest you many things, but do the two boys go back to their original girlfriends or girls go back to the original boyfriends? 
Do they switch? Does one couple pair off and the other not pair off? I saw that in Salzburg when you were working mm -hmm. in Salzburg. Um, or do none of the four go back to their partners? It's open. And, and do they you go on to something <laughs> you else? You can do it all ways, I do think. Do you have any feelings about how they wind up? I think Mozart um, tricked us a little bit because uh, the very end it's in C major and it's very jolly music. So, questo è il fin di chi fa... Right, no. Mm -hmm. right, am I... Is yeah. that the right one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's San Giovanni, right? No, wait. But how it does it go? <laughs> no, uh, it's in, but it's C major. Um. We'll remember. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. I just did it like two years ago during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, anyways, it's, it's, it's very... Because because opera buffa had to end with a happy ending. Yeah. So, what he really wanted at the end of that, we d maybe won't, we'll never know, because he was constricted by the form of ending it in a good way. Like Don Giovanni, you know, like you have the end, the real end, which is him going to hell, and then, questo è il fin So, so um, but my take on it is that after that journey, it's impossible to go back to how it was before. That's, yeah. That's my take on it. But. but for many, many years, that is how it was done because Cosi had sort of fallen out of the repertory yeah. and then was rediscovered when Glyndebourne, the Glyndebourne Festival, was created in the 1930s. That was the first opera they did. Yeah. But at that time, you wanted everything to be put right, so you went back to the partner you were with, even if that's not your hormones are saying something else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the British at that time said, you have to go back to the person we're with. Yeah. But the Salzburg version I saw was very persuasive. It was with Luca Pizzeroni, was the baritone, and I discussed it with him after because he and the mezzo-soprano suddenly discovered that while they had, pardon the term, a quickie off stage. Ultimately, they were not attracted, whereas the yeah, other two yeah. genuinely developed loving feelings. Yeah, the, the duet of yeah. Ferrando and Fiordiligi. And so I they went know. off in a direction that was actually a loving direction, whereas the other two mm. were mystified and unhappy. Mm. It's wonderful, yeah. because you can do this any which way. One more thing about Cosi, because it never gets enough discussion. Um, quite a number of years ago, I was teaching an intensive opera class at the American uh, Military Academy at West Point, the Army. And these are very adult, very brilliant young people, men and women, when I was there. And I took them to two operas, to Aida and Cosi Fantute, because I thought, OK, Aida will have issues for them because it's a military opera. And Cosi Fantute will be about romance, and while it was the American Military Academy, maybe I could prod that a bit about personal relations. To a man and woman, they all said, oh, we get Aida. Aida is about obligation and service and so on. We get that. That's what we're trained in. There's nothing to discuss. Thank you to say that to your teacher. There's nothing to discuss. But we want to talk to you about this Cosi Fantute because it was very upsetting for us. Apparently, they had discussion in, in, the, in the meal hall about how upsetting it was. Well, why was it upsetting? Because these two women were upset, Fiori Leach and Dora Bella, were upset when their boyfriends pretended to go off to war. And the drama of going off to war was made light of in this opera as a ruse to confuse the girls when they came back as Albanians yeah. and all that. And that how can you play with someone's feelings when there's something as consequential as war involved? This is why I love teaching opera, because I learn from the people I teach. But ever since that experience at West Point, I take this opera even more seriously, mm -hmm. because what we may see as lighthearted to certain people is profound life and death stories, even in a comedy. So what I'd like to do now <laughs> is do an exercise that I love to do with conductors and repetitors. It's not a test, because I'm not into that. But we're going to, Speranza made her Met debut last week, I think. 
10, con- yeah, yeah, 10 days ago. 10 days ago, conducting Verdi's Rigoletto. And I want to play two versions with two tenors who she's conducted. The names don't matter, but it's about comparative listening. You conducted both. One of them was live, one was in the studio, one hap- the live one happened to be a rehearsal. But so we're not saying, is this good, is this not good? But given that basically it's the same music, two different tenors, two different voices, neither one of them Italian, I will say that to you. Um, let's listen to that one. And then if you want to comment a little about that one, and then we'll hear the second one. And then we'll do comparative listening, because this is central to you opera goers and to us opera workers in terms of understanding this music and why we can spend a lifetime working on one single opera, not to mention many. So Julian, if you please, number three, and then we'll have a little pause and then number four. Stanti, prima che il mio presagio interno sull'orma corsa ancora mi spingesse. Schiuse la luscio e la magion Che ne sfera gli angio 
So before you play the second one, Julian, uh, Speranza, any musicological comments on that? Um, yeah, first of all, this was done in 2015. Um, sh should I say it or not? Who's singing? No, after. Just the year, you yeah. should know. Um, the, the, the singer was making an album which was of different arias. So, um, in that case, you know, the conductor has to also adjust very much to what their tempo or their, how they feel comfortable, because it's like a solo album of featuring that singer. So, um, I, listening to it now, I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever listened to it since we did it, so. Um, I like that he's doing the original cadenza, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the original cadenza from Verdi. Uh, and um, yeah, but let's wait for the other one. Okay, Julian number four, please. Mm -hmm. Same tempo. Istanti, prima che il mio presagio interno sull'arma corsa ancora mi spingesse schiuso era l'uscio e la maggion Thank you. 
So correction, this was actually from the opening night. This gives it away a bit mm. of the Met 10 days ago. Um, but we won't say the tenor's name yet because it's really not about names. It's about performances. You talk first about your reaction, then I have something to say. It's interesting to see how um, seven years apart, my opening was same tempo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, quite astonishing. Um, now that I think about it, I think when we did it in the studio with, with the first tenor, uh, he liked a more broader tempo. And so I adjusted to that. Uh, and um, I just noticed two big differences is that um, both go to up to the B flat at the end, which is not written by Verdi. Les Ferri agli angeli. It's written G flat, not B flat. But that's a, a tradition which um, I, I quite like, actually. Uh, but there's two different ways of conducting that. And uh, in these two performances, I notice now that the first tenor did what um, is more traditional. Uh, and um, uh, now I realize that I sort of imposed the Verdi <laughs> version in what I did 10 days ago. Um, because usually they, they like to hold that note forever, which that's not quite the way it should be, but it's fine. But what you need to do is, in order for them to hold that a little bit longer, um, usually it's on one beat, so, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if they hold it, then you're like stuck what are you going to do with the second right. beat? Yeah. So usually, <laughs> usually, and that's what happened with the first version, you will beat six beats, and then they sing the rest of the cadenza after you've finished with the orchestra, which is not what's written, because they go, da right? Yep. Uh, what we did... Uh, here, because I try to usually, uh, especially if I have rehearsals and it's a full production, what I do to accommodate the tenor is I stretch the first beat so that I don't have to then, I could still do my second beat. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
um, sferi agli angeli impampadati dati dati so that he can start the cadenza with my five seven chord i'm getting a little technical but that's that's something i just noticed which i'm very pleased about co compared you know the two things but again, I come back to the fact that the first was a, a, a studio recording um, and uh, to highlight, it's the tenor's album. So most of the tr musical choices in those cases um, come from the singer. Uh, whereas in this uh, other version, um, it's a mix of both. For example, I like a s more, um, how do you say, scorrevole tempo. Um, Done fluid, fluid. Yeah, running. but yeah. then because of his necessities and what he's doing, I adjust slightly here and there because he needs a little more space. Um, and so there are moments where he's slowing down, and then I push him again. These are very slight little things, but and the both tenors come from countries near Italy, very close to Italy, but are not Italian. How do you feel about their pronunciation? Well, the first one is now officially also Italian. He has Italian passport because he's been living there for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can tell, I think. Um, but very good, also the other one. Mm -hmm. And the second tenor, when I listened to it before, I didn't have this impression, but hearing it tonight, I had a very strong impression. It sounds like Alfredo from La Traviata walked into Mantua. <laughs> and because the dynamics and the, the sunniness in the mm -hmm. voice, at a moment that's not necessarily sunny, um, io vivo, io vivo quasi in quasi in shell de sound, which I'm not criticizing, yeah. but it was a choice that he sort of bloomed his voice in a way that the first tenor didn't. I think for dramatic effect. I also think that because it was a live performance, it's different. Yeah, it's, it's There's of course. a lot more going on that does it's not alive, happen in the yeah, studio. Yes. Um, and the point of this is why we love going to the same operas repeatedly and hearing different people do them because we learn different things each time or given new ways to consider music that I, we think should, we know. Yeah. I should also add that uh, we've already done four performances now. I mean, three more, uh, and it's it's changing all the time. Like last night was very different from what we heard now, for example. So when I hear it on the 8th of December, it could be different again? Yes, okay. absolutely. In fact, I think it's his last show, then the cast changes. Yeah. By the way, Rigoletto opened on the 10th. It's being done on, it was done on the 14th, the 17th, the 20th, the 26th, the 29th, December 3rd, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, 20th, 23rd, and 29th, you have no excuse not to yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Got Pick that? Pick your date. <laughs> Pick your date. You have no excuse not to go. Um, who are the tenors? Uh, first one is Samir Pirgu. He's Albanian, but naturalized Italian. And Benjamin Bernheim, he's French. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because sometimes foreigners do a lot more with the language than do Italians or whatever your opera language is because they have to study it in a different way than people. I purposely did not pick an Italian singing it tonight because that would have changed the relationship of how we listen. Julian, set up number six, please. Um, oh, I love this one. I do too. You yep. I have worked, a story about this one. Then I, we're going to hear the story. <laughs> You're... One of your first albums, I think your first maybe, yes, was first. with the really wonderful, gorgeous, Amazing. physically, but also as an artist, uh, Latvian soprano Marina Rebecca, who is a bigger star in Europe than here, although she has had starring roles here. When the Met did a new production of Norma a few years ago with Sandra Radvanovsky, the second, the third Norma was Angela Mead, who's been in this chair, but two performances were Marina Rebecca, who had never sung the role before. And I went to all three different Normas. She was fabulous. Yes. And she's an amazing artist. And how did it come to pass that you and she got to do a recording together? Do you want to know it now or after the, the after, aria? After. 
So we um, hear the aria and then... We'll hear the aria. This is not everybody's Mozart. It's Domineo, Elettra. It's one of the first great mad scenes in all of opera, well before Donizetti and, and Bellini and others wrote mad scenes. This is one of the great mad scenes. So, Julian, if you please, number six, the character of Elettra from Mozart's Idomeneo. So I met Marina in 2009 in Salzburg. She was making her big debut uh, in Moise Faron di Rossini, the role of Anais, which is very, very difficult. She has amazing coloratura, this woman, and, and the laser beam voice. And it was her debut with Maestro Muti. I was the pianist and assistant on that production. And it was the very first thing she did internationally where everyone was like, wow, who's this, who's this singer? So we became very good friends. And then when I made my debut at Yale, I came to New York after the debut and she was singing Don Anna at the Met. And we went to have dinner uh, and I showed her on my iPad uh, the overture of the Cusi Fan Tutte I had done at Yale, so, and she looked at it and then she said, Speri, I want to do an album of Mozart arias. Yeah. 
and uh, the album will be all the main female characters, ranging from Pamina to the Queen of the Night to uh, all sorts of voice types. I mean, this Anna Elvira, Ferdigi and Führung, uh, you name it. Mm, I think Papagen is the only one who's not there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, for example, I've never sung the Queen of the Night on stage. She said, I have an F. I just, before I lose it, I'd love to, <laughs> to uh, record it. And so, and I said, wow, that's a great idea. And she said, I want you to conduct this album. Mind you, I had just made my debut as a conductor at Yale with students. And I said, but Marina, like, <laughs> she said, well, you have, we have, um, it's not going to be now. We'll, we're going to do it in the spring. And um, what I want to do is prepare the whole album with you at the piano. And so this way I will be sure that then you will do what, what we worked on with the orchestra, which was the Liverpool Philharmonic Great Orchestra. Yeah. We had no rehearsal with the orchestra at all except uh, two hours before the recording. We, we read all the stuff. Um, the orchestras in England are amazing at sight reading. They are really stunning that way. So we had five days to put on the whole al album, which I encourage, not because it's, you know, I did it, but it's a really interesting because I don't think anyone has ever recorded an album where you sing the Queen of the Night and on the same album, Donna Anna and Donna Elvira, and uh, I don't know, has I'll it? Check that, maybe check. Deanna Damrau, but we'll check. Yeah, maybe, yeah. but when? After her, maybe. Yeah. Or, I don't know, it was 2013, so. Um, so that's the story, and, uh, and it so happened that that recording was the first time I ever worked with a professional orchestra. So yeah, this because it wasn't been students before that. This deepens the compliment I was about to pay you, and I'm saying it not as your friend, but as an expert, okay? okay. Thank you. <laughs> that this aria, after James Levine, was the best conducted I've ever heard of this aria. Oh, wow. Thank you. And because you captured the theater in it, because this was a recording, but I could, I knew what they were singing about all the characters in, in this recording, but specifically this one, which is why I picked it, because Mad seems to be very over the top. This was not over the top. This was just at a simmer and a boil <laughs> because the moment comes where she goes a little cuckoo mm -hmm. at the end. <laughs> right, but if you, if you indicate that that's coming, you ruin the madness mm -hmm. when it arrives. James Levine did it right, you did it right. Many conductors sort of say, all right, be prepared. She's going to go nuts. <laughs> and then it ruins it. Yeah, thank so you. when it actually happens, that. it's good. Now, so I think we recorded even the whole recitativo before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Another thing that um, is particular about the role of Eletra, as in Electra, same woman, is that she could be played by very Wagnerian types. So... I heard Hildegard Behrens do it, but I also heard in Vienna a wonderful performance by Barbara Friedley who did it in a different voice, in a different mm. way than would a Wagnerian. And what's so particular about this character is that indeed she could go either way. Mm. She could be Wagnerian or Straussian, or she could be strictly Mozartian, Verdian, Puccinian. Mm. And Marina Rebecca for now is more in the latter mm -hmm. frame, but I can picture her and being your Elsa but in this, Lohengrin. I was going to get to that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because this was 2013, and yeah. she's an amazing artist who has developed um, incredibly in during the last years. She's singing. Uh, her voice has developed a lot, and she's believe it or not, she even sang Madame Butterfly uh, last year. Uh, it's a big voice, and it's flexible. Her queens are the three queens of Donizetti. We're doing a big concert in Paris with her this year, coming up. March 21st. Those I mean, of you oh, watching yeah. in Paris, I <laughs> keep up on everything. <laughs> wow, I'm <laughs> impressed. Um, uh, Roberto de Verrue, all of, all of these uh, are really her. And of course, Traviata is, I think she's one of the best Traviatas yeah. um, around. I, I think she's retired the role now, but I'm not sure. 
she recorded it finally and then but I'm not I'm, I'm not sure about that and one of the things on that program will be sometimes it's my favorite opera Rossini's Semiramide which without Semiramide we wouldn't have Aida is my opinion um, basically everything that the great Italian composers after Rossini did they drew from Rossini in one way or another and so Semiramide is that mm -hmm. and Belraggio Lusinger is an impossibly hard aria, but when it's done really well, there's nothing more exciting to me in opera than hearing a singer sing Belraggio Lusinger purely musically. I'm not talking about the drama because, frankly, all she does is stand there and sing. But it's when I heard Sutherland do it, and when you hear great, 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 great singers do it, it's absolutely thrilling. So speaking of absolutely thrilling, it was absolutely thrilling to have you here tonight, oh, Spidanza. She was it's supposed been to, great be to be here, here. <laughs> but then the pandemic got in the way. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. So medopera.org, and you have a whole bunch of dates coming up to see Rigoletto, and I'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I have a favor to ask you in the present. On Thursday, Fred's mom, that you know because she normally sits in these chairs. No, but it's a beautiful number. Yeah. She has a big birthday coming, and since she would be here, and she will come again, but I want us to sing happy birthday for her. Yes. And I ask Maestra Speranza mm -hmm. to please conduct us. Wow. Eh? Um, so the name is Bernice. Bernice. So, Bernice. so happy birthday, Bernice. Uh, Maestra. What pitch should we start it on? That I don't know. I'm the coach. Let's see. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bernice. Happy birthday to you. Yes, thank you very much. Viva Bernice. Grazie. <laughs>